Okay, so we have a very important topic, side channel analysis. So for people who haven't heard it before, this might be a little bit shocking because by performing side channel analysis or this kind of attacks, it is possible to break some cryptographic algorithms like RSA or AES. So, so far we said that AES is secure, but it is theoretically secure and your implementation may have some weaknesses. So here, when you perform a side channel analysis and break an algorithm, actually you're not breaking the algorithm itself or the cryptographic algorithms design criteria, but actually you are breaking the implementation, okay? Because physical characters, characteristics of your implementation may leak information, more importantly, your secret key. This is the whole idea. So let's start and see what can we do, okay? Let's talk about embedded systems first. An embedded system is some combination of computer hardware and software that is specifically designed for a particular function, right? So this is actually what we are dealing most of the time with IoT or lightweight cryptography. Recently, embedded systems have become more and more complex and are close to the functionality of a PC, for example, smartphones or tablets. Many side channel attacks focus on small embedded systems where all components, including RAM, flash memory, etc., that are critical for security applications are integrated on a single piece of silicon. Okay. And uh, when you're trying to build it smaller, you leak more information or, you know, you get rid of some security uh, properties so they become more vulnerable, more vulnerable. Attacks on systems with multiple chips can be performed in similar ways and are typically simpler because in some systems, you know, some chips, some chips have specific purposes and so on. So attacking, it might be uh, simpler. Integrated circuit market, more than 5 billion devices per year. So it is a huge market. And not all of them have security properties, okay? So, in general attack scenarios, we only assume that the communication channel is insecure and the attacker can ease the rope, right? So this is what we assumed so far. This is what we, this was the main idea when we were designing cryptographic algorithms. In case of embedded systems, the attacker often has more power. For instance, think about pay TV. The broadcasting company gives smart cards to customers. Customers may try to duplicate the card, right? Because you're physically giving them a card and this, or a device, right? Electronic purse, the customers might want to add money to themselves. Digital rights management, the customers might want to copy the material for their friends. Think about it old PlayStations or other consoles, right? Uh, you can buy some old PlayStations where you're allowed to install any game without paying it because it is broken. And generally they are broken by a side channel attacks, okay? Brand protection, the customer wants to use cheaper ink batteries. So you want your, uh, you want your customers to buy, for instance, inks from your company and so on. So, uh, these are important concepts, but you are giving the customer the physical device, okay? And designing an embedded system, it is necessary to assume that the customer will try to break it. That is the whole idea. So attacks on embedded devices, you can do social engineering, logical attacks like software vulnerabilities, API attacks, you can perform cryptanalysis, but physical attacks, where we are going to talk about such analysis, is that observe and manipulate physical properties of the device or its environment, okay? And we will see some examples about it. So actually, I forget, I have to go back to my first slide to give credit, actually. These slides are actually uh, adapted from Stefan Mangak's course slides titled Secure Implementation of Cryptographic Algorithms, okay? It was a very nice course and I actually shortened it just to give the main idea. Okay, sorry for not mentioning it beforehand. So he actually gave a very nice example. So I want to stick to these examples. Then you will understand how it applies to cryptography, okay? So think about then physical attacks. So you find the USB stick with secret data on it, okay? So you plug it and to access it, you need to enter an eight digit pin. 
Okay. The device has a delay response. So one trial takes one second. Okay. Brute force requires 10 to the eight seconds. This is about three years. So you cannot try one by one. Okay. Question is, can we do better? Okay. This is the actually where side channel attack comes into play. So let's look at the uh, design and let's make some assumptions. So let's assume that password check is implemented on an embedded ARM processor in a straightforward way. It checks correctness of the first digit. If it is correct, then checks if the second digit is correct. If it is correct, it continues and checks the third digit. But at any step, if it is not correct, you know, it gives an error saying that you cannot log in. Okay. Thus, execution time is directly proportional to the number of correct pin digits, right? Because this actually determines how many operations the device makes. Because, for instance, for an eight-digit pin, if your for if your first seven digits are correct, they have to perform all of the digit operations, right? If not, for instance, if your first digit is wrong. They only perform one operation and you know give you uh, an error. So the time depends on how many digits, first digits you give correctly. So a timing attack on this scenario works like this. Select a random pin value, okay? Fix all digits except the first one. Measure the timing for all 10 possible values for the first digit. The value that leads to the longest execution time is the correct one because that one makes that the first digit is correct, so they are performing to check the second digit. Doesn't matter if the second one is correct or not. So this way, in 10 trials, you get the first digit, right? Now, <clears throat> since you know the first digit, fix it, set the first digit to this value, and proceed with the next digits in the same way. So now, instead of 10 to the eight, you need to perform 10 times eight, which is 80 trials. As you can see, from three years, now it is 10, 80 seconds. If the timing measurement is noisy, averaging over multiple measurements needs to be done. This is actually what we do inside channel attacks. You perform many times and get the average to see the correct value and get rid of the noise, okay? So, as you can see here, we haven't broken the system which requires eight pin digits, actually eight digit pin, but we broke the algorithm where the algorithm first checked the first digit, then checks for the second digit, right? So let's try to uh, overcome this problem. Checking every digit of the entered pin is not a solution because code requires more operations to be performed when digit is correct. Okay. So assuming that the designer of the USB stick inserts NOP which is no operation instruction, to balance the timing of both execution paths. So if you do it, this means that you know, uh, now the timing will be identical even if you perform the correct pin or the wrong pin, right? So a simple solution is to insert no operation, which actually doesn't do anything, but it is an instruction. So this way, the timings are almost identical. So if I solve the problem like this, can we attack the system now? Because timings are now identical. For instance, let's uh, go back to our example. We fixed the last seven digits and we tried every 10 possible first digits. In the previous example, it took longer for the correct pin. Now it takes almost the same. So I cannot attack with the timing. So can I do better? I mean, can I do uh, an attack that breaks this new version. Uh, I will give an example, but before moving on, let's see how these timings that are, are important. Timing attacks are particularly le relevant for asymmetric cryptography because, for instance, in RSA implementations, depending on your qubits, you might be performing more operations like squaring and multiplying and so on. So this way, by looking at the timing graph, you can say at which point the secret key bit is zero and at which point it is one, just by looking at the time, okay? But uh, so people think that it doesn't apply to symmetric cryptography, but attacks on symmetric cryptography is also possible if either the software implementation is not done carefully, 
the hardware as data dependent behavior. Here we are actually mentioning qubits. Each intermediate data values of all cryptographic algorithms carries information about the secret key. This is the idea. All of the operations depends on the key. So if you can get a timing uh, measurement for this, then you can break it. For example, let's look at AES example. During the matrix multiplication, multiplication by two means shift left. If most significant bits was one before the shift, add in hexadecimal notation one B to the result. This is because this multiplication is in the Galois field. So when you have the carry bit, you have to do these operations. Okay. Because the multiplication is not an integer multiplication, as I mentioned, it is a Galois field multiplication. But this means that you know it is different depending on different scenarios, right? So if it takes longer now that you know that that most significant bit is one, because you're performing an extra operation here. Okay. So timing was one operation one attack uh, technique but i show a method where we can get rid of the timing right by introducing no operation now let's break it and in this case we will focus on power consumption so the power consumption of digital circuits the vast majority of digital circuits are implemented using cmos logic the instantaneous power consumption of devices implemented implemented in cmos depends on the instruction that is executed, the data that is being processed. So if I introduce no operation, I'm not going to process any data, right? So it will consume less energy, less power. So if this is the consequence for the pin check implementation is that an attacker who measures the power consumption can easily detect whether no instructions are executed or not. So let's define a new attack. Select a random pin value, fix all digits except the first one, measure the power consumption for all 10 possible values of the first digit. Recall that in the first attack, I was measuring the timing. Now I'm measuring power consumption. In order to measure the power consumption, I need to have a physical access to the device, right? The value that leads to a significantly different power consumption than the other nine is the correct one. Set the first digit to this value and proceed with the next digit in the same way. 10 times 8, which is 8 power measurements, are enough to access the USB stick. Of course, there will be noise. So repeat the experiment a few times, and this way you, you are sure that you get the correct answer. So our first countermeasure didn't work, right? So how can we overcome this problem? Counteracting the power analysis attack is a challenging task. Many publications are available on this topic. Okay. Assume that the designer of the USB stick is able to balance the timing and power consumption of both execution paths. In other words, password correct and password wrong. So for instance, instead of introducing no operation, you introduce an operation that consumes the same amount of power. Let's say that we can do that. Then the next question, can we still break the system? Now, I cannot get timing information. It is kind of uniform. I cannot get power analysis or power consumption data because it is, again, uniform. I cannot detect any uh, strange behavior. So question is, can I still break it? The answer is yes. And this actually due to fault attacks. Here, we have to talk about reliance of digital circuits. Digital circuit requires certain operate think conditions to work properly, like temperature range, operating frequency, supply voltage, etc. Fault attacks is the solution to this. And uh, the idea is as follows. By changing the operating conditions, on, an attacker can bring the digital circuits into stage, states with undefined or unpredictable behavior. So. Actually, I'm not going to, to uh, give more information with the slides, but you have to understand what is going on. So assume an implementation where there is an if statement saying that, for instance, if A is less than 10, do this, else do the other operations, right? You simply write a code like this. So if else statement depends on either A is less than 10 or larger, okay? So assume A is less than 10. So in this scenario, the if condition will hold and we will run those operations, right? But
But if I have a physical access to the device, if I can make a fault in, I mean, if I inject a fault saying that A is actually not smaller than 10, you know, the code will move on to else statements, then run the operations there, but A is less than 10. So this will become, uh, this will do some undefined behavior, right? Because when you write the code, you're sure that A is never less than 10 and the else statements will run, okay? This is how the fault injection attacks work. So you are forcing the device to run in an undefined and unpredictable behavior, which generally makes the device to leak some information. 